I want to thank you for coming in and, and uh, getting us all jazzed up and following up uh, Renee's, yeah. Renee's uh, pitch. And uh, all, as always, as ever, uh, uh, Congressman, thank you. Now, now what, hand it off to, to Rod Deardon and, and, let, me, and let, me, let me ask you, because I know the answer to this question. When we defeat Measure D and this RTC begins to move forward with a rail plan, I know you're going to help, help us all to heck, right? Bring those, those federal monies here. And that's exactly it. And I appreciate you saying that. Um, and that basically that is our job as the federal yeah. representative to make sure that the funding is there for the infrastructure that the locals have decided on. Uh, and so that 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 vote is is a big vote, obviously, coming up here. Uh, but obviously, I look forward to playing my part if I'm so honored to be in this position there to make go. sure that those infrastructure dollars, those federal funding dollars are there. But look, it starts with you. It starts with people like like Rod Deardon, who who understands how important it is to ensure that we have the infrastructure that allows us to live and work here in this area. So, um, you know, knowing that there's someone like Rod on the call, I'm, I'm humbled uh, to be a part of this call because of everything that he's done for our community. And, and obviously being on this call, he's going to, he's continuing to be involved. And so uh, it's my real privilege and I'm sorry, I got to go. My wife's flying into Washington, so I get to go pick her up. But uh, on that note, it's my privilege to turn it over to Rod uh, Deardon Sr. Uh, and let him talk to the Mid-County Dems. Thank you guys. Thank you, Congressman. <laughs> Be safe. Rod Deardon, I'm so I'm so happy to to have you here, and I'm going to give you a short short introduction. Um, you were you were from '93 to 2014 the executive director of the Mineta Transportation Institute, Transportation Policy Research Center, created in 1991 by Congress. But going way back, you're you you gosh you had uh, you you served uh, you received a B.S. in accounting and a, and a Master of Business Analytics in statistics in 63, but also served two combat tours as a naval officer in Vietnam. All of that before, uh, before your rich experience in transportation, past chair of the American Public Transportation Association. Um, how many terms uh, in 1971? The, the youngest person ever elected to Saratoga City Council. Uh, and on and on, but your your real legacy, I think, is the work in public transportation and rail transportation. And you're here tonight to 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 share with us this uh, important, vital, essential information. I think uh, when it comes to how we uh, how we move forward into the future with regards to transportation, fighting climate change, uh, energy efficiency, and, and, and all the rest. And so I just am so grateful for you to, uh, to come here and, and feel free to fill in any, any missing high, high points of your, your <laughs> incredible, incredible career, please. Um, Barry, you've done just fine and thank you very much. And I'd like to say hi to Renee and, and Suzanne uh, who are old friends from prior lifetimes. And uh, of course, Jimmy, I don't know Jimmy as well as I know his dad. Yeah. Uh, at, at 83 years of age, um, uh, he and I were peers. Uh, while uh, Jimmy is is more the age of my son, so uh, that uh, that that is a little bit of a disconnect there. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, try to go quickly because we we don't want to take you until midnight. But uh, what I'd like to do is remind you that. Uh, that we are in a climate change crisis, that rail transportation is the most efficient, both in terms of cost to, of, of operation, but also in terms of sustainability, in terms of climate change, the most efficient mode of transportation known to humankind, mm -hmm. other than walking and biking. <laughs> but in terms of mass transportation, uh, there is nothing that can come near rail transportation, especially electrically powered rail transportation, which is what we're looking for uh, ultimately uh, in your uh, corridor. Uh, so at, I'm going to focus a little on climate change and run through real quickly something that will make you pay attention to the fact that we should never lose an opportunity 
to uh, to fight that battle. And then I'll end with a comment on on Measure D. So if we could go to the PowerPoint, please. Uh huh. <coughs> Second. Got to just line it up here. There we go. The. Um, and just tell me when to advance, uh, Rod. All right. Uh, the. Uh, uh, let's go to the first slide. We've we've had five mass extinctions in the world, and uh, Dr. Shapiro, a uh, uh, lady who is the uh, director of uh, uh, she chairs the biology department of uh, Stanford Medical Center, and she's one of the most noted uh, biologists in the world. Gave a speech recently to the San Jose Rotary Club, and in it she began by saying, "We are in the sixth mass extinction." We have begun the sixth mass extinction. So, you know, the last one was 66 million years ago. It took us a little while to evolve what we have now. If we want to start all over again, well, we're going in the right direction. But if we want a future for people that look like you and mammals, then we better do some very rapid changing. And I'll walk you through that now. All of what you're going to hear. <laughs> All of what you're going to hear today is science that has been confirmed by uh, a double peer reviews and, uh, and is factual. At the end, I'll give you the references and you can follow up yourself, uh, but uh, it is absolutely factual. Next, please. Climate change is happening. It's caused by human beings. Some of the impact is already irreversible. If we act today, we still have an opportunity for warm-blooded critters to be sustained on Earth. If we don't act today, we are lost. Now, uh, next, please. Uh, that, that statement was verified by 99.9% .9 of the scientists in the world. There's still 0.1% out there that are paid by the oil companies, and they're coming out with confusing data but the, the, all of the Nobel laureates and, and the scientific community agrees with what I just told you. 11,000 of the top scientists, all the living Nobel laureates, have signed a climate emergency declaration asking the world's nations to declare a code red in terms of, of climate change and to begin acting on an emergency basis to try to uh, reverse this trend. Next, please. <clears throat> just so you all know it and can answer the questions if you're asked. And by the way, you can have this uh, PowerPoint and present it uh, at your, your uh, local home and school clubs or, or scouts or uh, city councils or chambers of commerce or whatever. Uh, please, please do use it. Uh, but the way climate change occurs is that energy comes from the sun it hits the earth, and in the past, most of it's bounced back out into the atmosphere, into the universe. But now, because there's a blanket of CO2 and other gases that's surrounding the earth, and that blanket is thickening rapidly, the energy is coming from the sun, hitting the earth, and bouncing off and hitting the inside of that blanket and bouncing back down to earth. That recycling of the heat is cooking the planet. There's no other way of putting it. We're cooking our home. Next, please. Now, that's a quote you can use if you'd like. Uh, somebody caught it uh, who was preparing this. Next, please. This is very important. <clears throat> There's a scientific uh, group down on the Antarctic on top of an ice shield that's five miles thick. They bore down through that ice shield and they have checked the uh, little tiny bubbles in the layers of ice going back 800,000 years. Now, those four countries, Russia, the United States, China, and the European community don't usually agree even on the time of day, but they agree on this research. And you can see the ice ages and you can see the warming periods and the ice ages and warming periods all the way across over 
to where we are now. And then you see the red arrow, it's off the charts at the top. That is, that is four times the average carbon in the atmosphere as any time in the last 800,000 years. It's twice the highest point, the peak period in the last 800,000 years. Well, what's that causing? Next, please. Carbon in the atmosphere is causing the recycling effect of, of climate change. And you can see that it really took off in the, in the mid 1990s as we came back from the Second World War and we began relying heavily upon mm -hmm. petroleum power to move our cars, uh, run our, our agricultural equipment, uh, uh, run our lawnmowers and leaf blowers and, and everything you can imagine. And so the, the heat in the atmosphere is what you see on the right-hand side of that chart. So it's the last six years were the hottest six years in the history, in the recorded history of our planet. That's gotta be telling us something. And it's not just a little bit hotter, it's going up very rapidly, as you can attest by the, by the forest fires and the other kinds of problems we're having. Next, please. Uh, okay, we've got uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. The CO2 is causing heat. Where is it coming from? CO2 is coming primarily from cars. We don't have to be told that uh, when we light off 40,000 vehicles each morning in California, buses, trains, planes, uh, tra uh, trucks, uh, lawnmowers, leaf blowers, and all the other petroleum powered devices. We don't have to be told that it's causing uh, huge amounts of, of pollution in the atmosphere. Well, that's that's 38, almost 40%. Uh, industry, we can't really reach. Government has to reach the industry, but we can, we can totally handle electric generation and imports. So that's together, that's 60% of the problem. And if we don't handle that 60%, we're not gonna get there. No matter, you know, we can look down at agriculture, uh, the cows over in Central Valley are, are making methane. Uh, we, they're burping or whatever it is that they're doing over there. And so we, we've got to teach those cows not to burp. Well, forget, don't forget it. We ought to all eat better and, and not eat as much cow meat and, and, and all of the other things that are down at the bottom. But if we do all of those things, we're not gonna get there. If we don't do the transportation and energy side of it. Next, please. Next slide. Next, please. Yes, please. Yeah. Now that's the solution. Cars, air, and buses are awful. In terms of uh, carbon per seat mile, uh, the, uh, we, that's what's killing us. That is what is killing our future for our babies. The solutions are on the left-hand side. Uh, High-speed rail, electrically powered light rail, uh, commuter rail. Uh, uh, and by the way, most of the buses that are being purchased now are electrically powered. So that bus, that bus column is gonna be coming down unless you have an old fleet. Uh, of course, electric cars are, are wonderful too. Next, please. <laughs> So you, you, we already know what's happening. I'll skim through these because I don't need to, to, to dwell on them. Uh, we're, food production in the central part of the world around the equator is stopping. It, it's being desertified and the ability to raise food for your family or raise food for export uh, is, is being eliminated. The result is that masses of people are leaving those areas. The governments are no longer viable. And so they can't sustain their people. The people are leaving and they're piling up against a dumb fence in the south part of the United States uh, and, and dying and, and being treated inhumanely. When we need those people in the United States because we don't have enough people to employ. And, and the same thing is happening in Europe. They're drowning in the Mediterranean, trying to get out of North Africa and uh, and the reason why that mass migration is occurring is because they can't produce food and their governments are no longer viable in the, uh, in, along the equator around the world. Pandemics, I'm not gonna talk about, that's, that's, you understand that. Water shortages, 
uh, water shortages, water is going to be the most valuable asset on earth. It is already more valuable on a per volume basis in the stores than oil. And it, it should be, oil is toxic. <laughs> and uh, so we've got to figure out a way to protect our water. You can't do that if we have climate change because the water, uh, well, well, the water uh, evaporates from a, a much hotter ocean much more rapidly. And that, that uh, warmer ocean water is then turns into vapor. It goes up into the clouds with much more pressure behind it. Those clouds are then not gently pushed over to the beach, but they're pushed over with hurricane winds. They hit the beach and, and, the, and the land is much warmer so that instead of the, the precipitation falling in, in snow and being retained for water for the, for the summer periods, it runs right off causing floods and, and then leaving the summers dry and subject to fires and, and floods and droughts. And that's the, that's the next issue. Uh, and of course, the polar ice caps are melting. We were, already, were told now that the northern polar ice cap is going to melt. There's no way of protecting it. It's going to be gone. And if we lose the pole, northern ice cap, the Greenland ice shield, and the South Pole, the water will go up between 100 and 200 feet right. in the oceans throughout the world. That means you folks are going to have to learn to swim. And, and uh, that's, that's scary. That's just a terrible thing. So we've got to stop it. We've got to reverse it now. And that re is going to require uh, uh, intergovernmental courage throughout the world that has not been shown so far, but must be shown now. Yeah. Next, please. <laughs> this is the next, this is the key point. 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for the United Nations came back, and that panel had 72 Nobel laureates on it. By the way, uh, came back uh, with their their benchmark study, and it said that we may have as little as 12 years left before the major issues of climate change would become irreversible forever. And it would only get worse after 12 years. They did a check study in preparation for the, the uh, summit recently in Scotland and found that climate change was occurring faster than expected. And that we, they expected that point of no return to be somewhere around 2030. And that we needed to, to do all we could throughout the world between now and 2030 to push that date away off into the future by making re remedial action. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is what I just told you, only it's in a bar graph now or in a chart now. Uh, the green line is what if we make the 2030 deadline, then we can continue to live. It's not as comfortable as we've been, but our children will be able to have a living uh, uh, on into perpetuity. If we don't make the changes now, by 2030, then the, we're on the red line. And that red line is to oblivion. Next, please. Here's Hal Harvey, uh, an old friend uh, from up at Stanford, and he tells us the way forward. He's an expert on energy. Next, please. We had to transform the power grid completely over to electric energy. Mm -hmm. Electrify everything. No more natural gas, no more petroleum for cars, no more uh, wood burning stoves uh, uh, in America, but also throughout the world. And we've got to do it as quickly as we can possibly do it. Um, transportation, of course, is the very most serious issue because that's where most of the, the pollution is coming from. And we need to do that at a very rapid pace. Next, please. Uh, now let's get to where you guys are. Um, High-speed rail is going to come through the county and it is going to. Uh, uh, by the way, did you see the poll from UC Berkeley, an objective pollster that said 56% uh, of the voters in the state of California supported the high-speed rail project, supported the completion high-speed rail project while only 35% opposed, the rest were undecided. 
in our area, in Northern California, is 65% in favor with only 20% opposed. Hmm. So it's, it's a very popular project. And this was a brand new poll, just came out hmm. and uh, done by the best uh, researchers in the world. And so it's gonna be done. It's almost done in the Central Valley. We're negotiating for the funding now to bring it from the Central Valley under the Pacheco Pass and tunnels and into Gilroy, uh, up through San Jose, whatever that station is called, and <laughs> over, <laughs> over to San Francisco. And that is important for you folks here because the Gilroy station will become a major interchange point for the rail systems coming in from Hollister and from Monterey and from Santa Cruz, maybe. <laughs> rail systems coming in from Hollister, that's committed. They're working on it. Ma rail system coming in from Monterey. Tamsi is working on it. They're committed to it. The rail systems coming in from Santa Cruz has been working on it. Committed in law now. But that's about to be challenged. And that's why I'm here for the rest of my presentation. If you really believe that you want to have a life for your kids coming up, then you want to put every person you can take off of the freeways onto a mass transportation system that is electrically powered. Because we're not going to see all of the old clunkers, even if we begin buying only electric vehicles by 2030, which is the governor's objective, tough one. You're gonna have the old petroleum powered vehicles on the road for the next 40 years. We don't want that, but there's no way in the world to take, take the vehicles away from the people that own them now. So we need to have alternatives to those vehicles that will allow people to use their electric cars on the freeways, if they can fit on the freeways, but have an alternative to ride mass transportation conveniently, safely, and, and sustainably uh, from throughout your beautiful county, down to Watsonville and on over to, uh, on over to the main line of the Union Pacific Railroad at, uh, at Gilroy, where you can then hop on high-speed rail and be in LA in less than three hours. You can be in San Francisco in less than an hour. And what's wrong with that? That's, that's what the rest of the world does. All we need to do, all we need to accomplish here is courage, the courage and foresight to get it done. And I'll talk about cost if you wanna talk about cost in the questions. But I want to save the rest of the time. But I want to let uh, in my comment by noting that back in the early 1900s, a, a false corporation called the National City Lines was created by Standard Oil, General Motors, Firestone Tire and Rubber Company, and a couple of other automobile related industries. They then went around the United States buying up the rail lines, the trolley lines, the commuter rail lines, and so on, and turning those right-of-ways over to the cities that then paved them over and bought buses and put cars. Of course, that made Standard Oil and General Motors very happy and, and eliminated the rail competition. What's happening to you now with Measure D is very similar to that. You have some very wealthy people who have automobile related uh, businesses who are putting that money into a campaign to eliminate the opportunity for you to ever have a rail line in the future. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you with great certitude that there has never been a rail line that was purchased for a so-called rail uh, tra uh, uh, bikes to uh, to uh, rails, uh, rails to trails, I guess it is. There has never been one that has ever been turned back to rails. Once the rails are torn up 
and sold and scrapped. And they're very valuable, by the way. That's high grade steel, very expensive. Once they're torn up and, and the bike or path takes over, uh, that's the end of the rail. It never comes back. So if Measure D goes into effect, believe it, this is the end of your rail system in Santa Cruz County. And, and uh, anyone that tells you otherwise is lying to you. Uh, so let me uh, uh, terminate my comment there and let you know that I'm happy to answer questions and I'm really rooting for you in terms of, of protecting your opportunity to be sustainable in the future. Thank you, Rod. You, you had a, a few more slides, but... Um... I, I think I'll, I'll uh, hold those off because they don't apply as well. Okay. Uh, I'll just That's save fine. time, Barry. Well, I, and I, I love that you're showing uh, this map. And when I speak to the public, of, very few people really appreciate how, how connected we are uh, by rail. And, and naturally, they, they don't, they haven't seen the rail line used for what it could be used for. And, and so, uh, but they're surprised to know that it connects, for example, at, at uh, Watsonville Station in Power Road. They're, they're surprised that there's freight activity there now. Um, so, uh, and what we'll be able to uh, share with people, uh, I think we can take some questions and, and, and then maybe uh, permit uh, Christina to show us a little bit about, uh, she, she sent some slides, has some slides to tell us about what, uh, what's going on regionally. So would you prefer we take questions or, do you, or, or let her uh, present? Well, uh, they, they might be on a different subject than Christina. I, well, then I, let's... I have I I respect Christina and have great affection for her. She's one of my students uh, yeah. in a prior lifetime. Okay, I'm I, I'm hoping she'll hang in here. She uh, she's I'm a big fan, and I think she's a big fan of of what we're trying to do here too. So let's go ahead and and look for. Uh, I think we had. Um, um, I'm going to stop the screen share so I can see the uh, ordinary uh, view for myself. And I'm looking in chat, and I think we we're going to ask Mark Johannesson, the co-chair, to maybe field some questions. Um, Gigi, and some of this is local, local questions. Like I wouldn't expect you to know about the cost of upgrading the trestles, but I have information I, I, on that. You know, I, I can I can tell you that that there's some cost involved. Yeah, but you know, Jimmy just told us that they created. $55 billion in the Build Back Better bill that has been passed by Congress. Mm -hmm. They had $66 billion in the uh, intergovernmental, uh, uh, inter uh, uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill that is set aside for rail transportation. Yeah. That, that, those are grants that you're going to get because Jimmy's tough enough to get them for you. And, and if you can get those grants and rebuild the bridges and and the rail and so on, why not do it? You know, if you're not gonna save money by turning it down, it's gonna to go to somebody else. So get that those funds, put them into your transportation system, but the money's there. Yeah, I, I thank you for that answer. And that one that one resonates with a lot of people. They don't they don't appreciate that if they don't, that they're already paying into a system that would pay for, for so much of this. And if we don't build, we don't get that money back. It goes somewhere else. That's exactly right. Um, I have Jenny asking a question, about, asking for a sense of, what's your sense of the value of the 32 miles of track or of this corridor? And she says, she goes on to say, the public needs to know what they would be throwing away if they vote for D. And, and maybe that's another way of asking, is, is the value of the line the steel and the ties, or is it the, the, the corridor and, that, and, the, and, and the permissions that we have to operate? You know, the current, it's already a railroad. How hard would that be to, to replace, to build from scratch? It would be impossible. It, uh, it, it not, well, let's say it's not quite impossible, but it's highly, highly improbable and it's never happened. Yeah. I guess the best test is, has it ever happened? There have been hundreds and hundreds of rail lines abandoned in the United States to, to become trails or, or highways or whatever. They've never been reestablished as rail lines, none of them. And, and so uh, to be told that you could do that is a lie. It's, it's a falsehood. And the, the, 
the, the value to you in your population center is, is not in the rails and ties and so on. It's in the future system. Mm -hmm. It's in a, 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 a electrically powered light rail system or a, a light trolley system, uh, all of which you could buy off the shelf and, and operate on that, that uh, line completely quiet. There's no fumes and, and, uh, and things, and you could operate it sustainably on that line uh, wonderfully, but you, uh, but you have to own it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think you might know Donna Marillo. She okay. has this question, can you speak about the alternative that others bring up? Like, why don't we just widen the highways? Well, Donna, I know very well. She used to be my assistant at the Mineta Transportation Institute, and she is one smart cookie, let me tell okay. you. Uh, uh, and the point is, uh, it's a, that's a softball, by the way, if you haven't imagined. Uh, the, uh, the highway is never going to serve you. Uh, you you got uh, four lanes, six lanes in some places on Highway 1 now. And, and even with that, it's stop start in some occasions. It's only going to get worse. You, you're going to have an eight lane freeway. You want an eight lane freeway on Highway 101, and that will still be overcrowded. And, and, uh, and then you won't have any alternatives because once you get to that width, you, you uh, can't expand it anymore because you're into people's backyards and, and so on. So the, uh, the freeway isn't going to be able to handle even if you should do it with the freeway, isn't going to be able to handle your transportation requirements. The, the, uh, that rail system with an electrically powered, quiet, sustainable trolley on it will handle as much as the freeway mm -hmm. and handle it cleanly uh, with no interference with your population. And, uh, and, and then the people who really feel they have to have a car can get out on the, on the long parking lot that you're going to be calling your freeway in the future. Yeah, thanks. I have another uh, question, which is, would we need a different kind of rail to have light rail? And I, I can answer that. Uh, the, essentially, we have standard gauge track here. We would modernize that. It would run a light rail or a freight train or the coast future like we just demonstrated. Is that right? <laughs> Barry, you could, uh, you're absolutely right. You could, on those tracks, although you'd want to strengthen them and upgrade the bridges and, and, um, and probably replace a lot of the ties, you would be able to run a uh, light rail. You could run the freight, uh, you know, if the Santa Clara County buys the old uh, Permanente quarry over on our side of the hill and puts it out of business, there's going to be huge pressure to see uh, Davenport reestablished mm. as a cement factory. Mm. Well, that's that's great. Puts people to work and 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 so on. But then you're going to have to have a rail line to get the, the product out of there. Uh, so you'd have that opportunity still. And uh, and then of course you can bring excursion trains in too, uh, on the tracks and park them down there at the at the boardwalk and and uh, have your your suntan special reestablished. Yeah, I've got a, a question in, in, in chat that uh, David uh, Van Brink uh, offers. He calls it a potentially delicate question, but I, I think it's a valid question. Do, should we, uh, and, and he asks uh, say perhaps a yes or no answer or not, uh, will we, do we need to eventually disincentivize car use? I mean, even electric cars have their drawbacks. What do you think about? David, David I, I think that we won't have to. There is no amount of pavement that we can create uh, in your county that's going to handle the commute traffic in the future. And when you're wall to wall traffic and you can't get down the street anymore, that's called terminal gridlock. When you're at that point, then that's a disincentive. And you're going to be out there hoping you have the train at that time. We're getting close to that. What's it called? Terminal? <laughs> Ter terminal gridlock. It occurred yeah. in, in Beijing about yeah. 10 years ago. Right. Um, we, uh, we remember we, we enjoyed a, a series of transit speakers in 2018. Jarrett Walker was one of them. And he, 
and he, you know, he noted uh, what seems obvious now that the easier you make something, the the more people will use it. So this this idea of adding lanes may make things better for a short period of time until the same number, you know, more people taking more trips until you're back where you started. Uh, yeah. That that idea of induced uh, demand, right? Induced traffic. Terminal gridlock. I'm looking for any other questions. If anyone has anything, feel free to to type something into the chat and and uh, and if not, if you have some closing statements, uh, Rod and, and of course I want you to stick around and talk more with uh, Christina. And I, I will listen, want to listen to Christina's presentation, but let me offer one last thought for you. Yeah, please. By 2030 or somewhere around that point, if we don't make the changes that we're told by science we must make, our beautiful children who are young adults by that time are gonna come and look us in the eye as they realize their futures are limited. Mm -hmm. and that their children are going to have a terrible time. They're gonna look us in the eye and they're gonna say, mama, papa, did you do everything you could possibly do when there was still time? Well, I'm going to say yes. What will you say? Wow. Well, well, there you go. Thank you. Um, well, be sure to uh, stay. And uh, Christina, if you're if you're ready, oh, let me see. Somebody had a question on housing. I'm going to take uh, one more question from Mark uh, Johannesson. Um, and Mark, you're 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 uh, my co-chair. Go ahead and unmute if you want to vocalize your question. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Rod. Uh, great presentation. Good to see you again, um, Mark. Same here. As a, a former city council person myself, um, I've dealt a lot in housing and how to produce housing. And one of the main problems I see with this initiative is to take rail um, out of planning in general. So we basically have one high density transit line, which is Highway 1 with limited expansion. Have you dealt with housing uh, in your term on, on council? And can you say anything about what uh, rail can do to promote affordable housing? Mark, it's a very, very good point. Highways cause urban sprawl. And the reason is because you can then put an off ramp anywhere you want, and you can extend the roads back into the countryside as far as you want, and you can build houses all around. Uh, or fed by those roads, theoretically giving, getting access to the roads. Of course, because you've scattered it out like that, it becomes unserviceable and a burden to the rest of the population because you can't get sanitation to them. The police, fire, library, schools become very, very low density and, the, and there's no tax base for it. That's what's called low density urban sprawl. That's, that's, what, uh, that's what Santa Clara County used to be known for. Uh, we stopped that. We stopped any development outside the urban areas. And now the focus is building on top of the train stations. So when you have a train station and a parking lot, over the top of the train station and parking lot, you put a podium and maybe 10, 20 stories of, of uh, apartments and condominiums on top of the train station. So you don't lose open space. You don't intrude into your your last watershed land, and you encourage people to force be force fed into the transit system uh, because they're going to be finding a job on the other end of the transit system someplace. Remember that if you if you save that rail line, <clears throat> you can get on the rail line in Gil in uh, Santa Cruz, take it over to Gilroy, hop on the Caltrain system, or maybe even start the Caltrain in Santa Cruz maybe a couple of cow trains in Santa Cruz and have it come up over into, into Gilroy and then right on down the tracks uh, to, to uh, uh, the Daredown station in Silicon Valley and have them take a feeder system. Another 10 to 15, 20 minutes from there, bus, light rail, commuter rail, uh, taxi, whatever they want to uh, into their jobs. And uh, our, our progressive industrial leaders have already said they're going to subsidize those tickets. They're going to support mass transportation. They already do in some cases. So it works. 
it works like the rest of the world is making it work. And we become good citizens to the world in the process by being sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. And thanks for the question, Mark. And I'm, I, I, forgive me for, for missing it earlier. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to keep my eye on the chat here. Um, so, so stick around everyone and, and, uh, and to feel free to ask questions of, of Rod and of Christina, uh, who I'm happy to uh, introduce. And I'm so grateful because your, uh, your, what's going on in Monterey is, is so, uh, is so helpful to, to our region, to our, our future. And, you know, we're not an island here in Santa Cruz County. We're connected to the rest of the, the rest of the state and the rest of the, the nation. And you guys have been really uh, moving forward with a lot of great projects. So Christina, uh, uh, welcome and uh, feel free to uh, say a few words about yourself and then tell me when to uh, share, start sharing your, your slides. You had nine slides with maps and great stuff. So take it away, Christina. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Rod, you're a really tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this was going to happen to me, too. <laughs> um, so Rod and I go way back. Uh, like he said, it was almost a lifetime ago. I graduated in um, 2007 from his Mineta Transportation Institute, studied under him um, for a master's in transportation uh, management. And that was a great experience. Um, it does feel like it was a million years ago, but I'm still working on the same project. So <laughs> um, these projects take a long time. Um, my name is Christina Watson. I'm now the TMC Director of Planning. I started at TMC in 2001 as a planner and just um, stayed at it and kept at it. And it really takes some serious dedication and persistence to get projects uh, like this built. So I actually, I think I can share my own screen, except it sure. says just a disabled participant screen sharing. You're welcome to, let me just make sure. Your... I think you're able to, just check if you can, take it away, do it. It says host disabled participant. Oh no, I'm taking it, I'm changing that, try it again. <laughs> okay, uh, here we go. I have the power, okay. So I have a whole bunch of maps, as Barry mentioned. Um, that's kind of my thing. I kind of love maps. Yeah. So are you able to see my screen? There, perfect. <laughs> perfect. Okay, great. Um, so I'm just going to be talking about all of the different rail projects that we have going on in Monterey County. And I'm happy if somebody wants to stop me on a slide to talk and ask questions or I can go through my whole presentation and we can go backwards to look at maps uh, afterwards if you prefer. So I'm gonna start with kind of a bigger, bigger picture of the region with the 2018 state rail plan, which um, the state is currently working to update for the 2022 adoption, but uh, this is still the, the one that's um, current in terms of what's been adopted. The other one is still just in draft form. And so the, the vision in 2018 for this year, 2022, uh, is reflected on this map. Um, it shows in a pale blue inner city rail. So that would be capital corridor trains. And um, this is the, um, the San Joaquin trains. Uh, the dark green is called regional rail. So this line here is the Caltrain corridor from San Francisco to San Jose. The pale, paler green is a less frequent regional rail and the palest green is even less frequent regional rail. So this shows the service that, continue, that currently goes to Gilroy continuing down to Salinas. That is not currently happening. <laughs> so I will get to that when I get to that project. But that was the vision. Uh, the, the orange is inner, inner city bus routes that connect in at a uh, rail hub stations. So that was the 2022 vision. Um, the 2027 vision, uh, five years later, includes high-speed rail. Uh, so that's the, the red line. And uh, the rest of the colors are just a little bit darker because the frequency of service is assumed to be more, um, more frequent. Um, the, You'll see that there's a, a blue line now extending south from Salinas, and that assumes a new service on the coastline to complement the Amtrak 
Coast Starlight that currently runs from LA to Seattle with one round trip per day. And this, uh, this map reflects an increase in service on that corridor with an inner city train that could either be Capital Corridor extended south to San Luis Obispo or the uh, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Luis Obispo train called the Surfliner extended northward to Gilroy or San Jose. That was the vision here with that blue line. And then the 2040 vision, which is the big picture vision, that's where you see the new green line between San Santa Cruz and Monterey. So that would be an around the base service that was first envisioned back in the 1990s when my now retired boss, Debbie Hale, who most of you probably know really well, worked at the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. So that story has been around for quite, uh, quite some time. Um, and that is what is included in the 2040 vision because of all the steps that it would take to get there. Yeah. So um, looking for a moment at the entire coast rail corridor from San Francisco to LA, this corridor is mostly in private ownership by Union Pacific. Caltrain owns the corridor between San Francisco and San Jose. And um, I think the end of UP ownership is down here at Moore Park. Uh, so UP owns from Moore Park to San Jose. And so this is the corridor that I am working with a whole bunch of other coastal um, agencies, including the RTC, to get another coast rail line service for passengers, um, a new through train that would complement the Coast Starlight. It would fill a gap in coast rail service um, that currently is only served by the Coast uh, Starlight and and it's not a commuter service. It's it's a long distance. It's a beautiful trip, but you you got to have time. This is about the journey, not the destination. On the coast daylight, uh, the coast starlight. Mm -hmm. So the in, the vision for this one is that would it be uh, more um, more economical and more expeditious uh, than the current service on the line. Uh, the next one, focusing in a little bit closer to our area here. Uh, this map shows all the different services that currently exist in the Bay Area and that are planned. So we have the Caltrain line that goes from San Francisco to San Jose with over 100 trains a day now. Um, three of those now go south to Gilroy. Mm -hmm. um, their service was scaled back significantly during the pandemic, but they have scaled back up. Um, riders are returning and they have um, the electrification project, which I saw there was a comment in the comments about the electrification uh, project that is well underway, it's it's fully funded, it has a, a big uh, federal grant, as well as a lot of state money on that project, and that is um, under construction to electrify the service. They can only electrify their line though. So that is from San Francisco to San Jose that's being electrified. South of San Jose, that would be uh, subject to the uh, high-speed rail project getting funding to be built. Um, and they are looking at um, having that service then once the high-speed rail line builds their line between San Jose and Gilroy, they were, the Caltrain could then move over to operate on the high-speed rail electrified corridor. Uh, but in the meantime, they still need to have some diesel trains that continue southward out of San Jose. And those are the trains that we are looking to extend down to Salinas. So we have fully funded the blue parts of this project. We have uh, already constructed the improvements at the Salinas train station that are the highway side of the project, um, the, the circulation elements and extension of Lincoln Avenue to have signalized access. And uh, we are at 90% um, plan specifications and estimates um, for the rail side of the project on Union Pacific tracks uh, between um, at Salinas to build a layover facility for the trains and between Salinas and Gilroy, um, at Gilroy, we need to connect the tracks to the, the through the mainline track because Gilroy is the end of the line for Caltrain and Caltrain couldn't continue south today if they wanted to. So we need to, to build those improvements to make that possible. And then I know um, in the future, our next priority, and this is of, of the most interest to this group, I think is the Pajaro Watsonville station. So we applied for a TERSIP grant and TERSIP stands for Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program. So that's a state grant that we applied for. We should hear next month if we got it. That would 
uh, fund the early phases of the project. So bring us uh, through the design, update our environmental. We have done environmental on the station, but um, with the new concept of having around the base service also be um, going through there, the design will have to adapt a little bit to make that possible. Even if we don't build for that in the near term, we still need to environmentally clear that. And so um, that would be part of the grant. Another part of the grant would be transit connectivity. So we, we worked with our partners at Santa Cruz Metro and Monterey Salinas Transit to ensure that those buses would stop at the, the Pajaro station and what would, what would it take to, to make sure that they could do that. So that'll be part of our design, part of our environmental clearance, and it's part of the funding. And then the, the third element of the, the grant application is the, trans, uh, uh, the trail segment that goes from the Pajaro River Bridge to the station itself um, uh, along the rail corridor and then onto Salinas Road um, to the station. So we're fingers crossed that we get that grant because then we can make uh, significant progress on that station and, and get it ready and poised to apply for federal funds um, or and or uh, more state funding. And then the, the third element of this project is the Castroville station, which is the linkage to the Monterey branch line. So very critical for us to be able to um, envision that around the base service to have a station at Castroville. So those stations do not currently exist. There are no stations there today. They did exist in the past. They were removed <laughs> and demolished wow. in the, the 70s, I think, maybe, maybe even not quite that long ago. But um, long enough ago that the no, no train has stopped at those stations in, in quite a long time. Uh, but part of our project is to reestablish those stations and make that possible. And then my next slide talks a little bit more about the Monterey Branch Line. It's in public ownership at 16 miles from Casterville to Monterey. And in 2009, the TMC board, the transportation agency for Monterey County board, adopted a light rail uh, as a locally preferred alternative, but did not get funding or support from the federal government for that alternative at that time. So it's been um, deferred until we secure funding for that. And in the meantime, we have been working with our partners at Monterey Salinas Transit to look at an interim service that we can use the corridor for a bus rapid transit line nicknamed the SURF project doesn't actually stand for anything, but we capitalize it anyway, um, that would go between Marina and Sand City on the Monterey Branch Line corridor, not taking away the rails, just going, because we have a hundred foot wide right of way, there's, there's room for a bus um, road. Um, and that would bypass the congestion on Highway 1. I don't think we're quite at terminal gridlock on Highway 1, but um, on some, some very busy weekends, it does look like that. And then that is, that is my whole presentation and there's more resources on our website and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Christina. And I'm, I'm looking for, for questions. I know uh, somebody, had, uh, uh, one of my friends had asked about the green line across the, the mid peninsula, but I think that was answered by another friend. Uh, the Dunbar Barton Rail uh, crossing exists up in the bay in the, the 2040 vision, I, I guess it is. Um, the, I, I have a question. While I'm looking for questions, I'm going to ask a question. The, I, you, when I look at your slides and you mentioned that you had the uh, preferred alternative 2009 light rail alternative, um, and, that, and, and thankfully you have, you have your railroad, most of the tracks are still in place. We, we similarly have a locally preferred alternative, which is electric light rail for our, for our branch line. And, um, but, for, uh, but for a tie vote, as you are probably aware of the commissioner's 6-6, six, six, we, we might be looking uh, for, you know, to, to do more planning with that. Um, is, is, uh, is your, your locally preferred alternative light rail 2009 project, something that is um, that, that you would, uh, that's like, does it have a, a shelf life or does it stay? Is that just remain until some other alternative happens? Yeah, well, um, right. So the locally preferred alternative was adopted 
13 years ago now. Yeah. We have uh, some of the same um, policymakers are still on our board. Some right. of them. Right. Quite right. a few of them. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> we tend to have sort of long, long, uh, very committed political uh, activity here in Monterey County for whatever reason. So um, they remember that. They remember that they made that that commitment back in 2009. And but for funding, um, we would have been, been moving forward with that. Uh, the compromise of working with MST to build a uh, bus rapid transit on the corridor at, on a small portion of the corridor, it's not even half the corridor length, is to show that there's demand for transit. Because that was the question that we got from Federal Transit Administration. First of all is prove it. Like we don't really yeah. see the same demand because they're used to dealing with major metropolitan cities, New York, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, L.A. That's what FTA is comfortable with. So a small area like ours, they see it as a very risky investment of federal funding. Yeah. So we had to we have to substantiate all of our um, assertions <laughs> that we would have people driving this train and and show that by having a bus corridor that is right there on the court on the rail line. Yeah. Um, and if we have a lot of riders on that bus corridor, that will help to make the case, as they say, uh, for the Federal Transit Administration to get funding. And the other option, of course, is to, to uh, seek state funding, assuming that that is the direction that the state continues to go um, with their climate action plan for transportation investments and other, other things that are pointing towards a lot more uh, intensive rail and transit investment. So we we do think that this is still a project that we it's still in our rail our regional transportation plan. It's still in the three county metropolitan transportation plan. It's just not funded at the moment. Yeah. Um, what kind of vehicle? We were always agnostic about that in our plans because technology for rail vehicles what was already changing at that point. Yeah. A lot of a lot of uh, rail providers were looking towards having. Um, electric, um, hybrid electric, hydrogen, and biofuels uh, was already the talk of the town back in 2009. So, and that obviously has accelerated. So we, we didn't commit to any particular kind of vehicle at the time. Excellent, thank you. Uh, yeah. A couple of questions have popped up. One is, one, uh, one uh, another friend of mine uh, wonders, oh, what is the condition of the Salinas River Bridge of concern, uh, or something that you're working on, and how big an obstacle is that? And yeah, go ahead and with that one. Yeah, so that was studied um, under the the when we were preparing to do an environmental document that never got uh, completed for that corridor. We did a very uh, intensive study about just that bridge. Yeah. Um, it would need to be thoroughly replaced. Um, it is. Um, uh, rusting, it yeah. is it is in need of complete uh, overhaul. So it would be the most expensive element of the project. So what the um, project proposal was when we were moving through that process was to start with the corridor that is fully intact from Monterey to Marina, uh, which is where the most of the travel is happening anyway. Right. And that would be phase one of the project. And then phase two would be the Salinas River Bridge. And then phase three would be to connect to Castroville. So we were phasing it out as uh, what the FTA calls minimum operable segments. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, so that was a good question. <laughs> An uh, another, uh, another good one. They're all good. Another good one. Uh, what lessons can Santa Cruz learn from TAMSI's efforts uh, of funding a locally preferred alternative? Okay. I... I, I mean, we we both share similar lessons. I think um, we're all we're all knowing that these projects take a long time. It takes um, a lot of people who are really passionate about it to make these projects happen and get them funded. You need a champion, um, a political champion, for the project. Right. Uh, Dear Don would know more about that than I do about how to how to get a political champion for your project. But um, you know. There's there's always ups and downs, and if, if you just keep incrementally planning towards some kind of success, which is, you know, I didn't even go into all the the evolutionary uh, ups and downs with the Rail to Salinas project that, yeah. you know, has been in the works for a very long time, and there's a reason why we deferred construction of Pajaro and Castroville, and that's because we had state support, we had state money, and we said, what can we build with the amount of money we do have? 
And so we scaled it back to be what we're doing now. Um, and even that, we, <laughs> we still had to value engineer. Good. Yeah. Which is short shorthand for cost cutting. <laughs> Save money. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I, I have a uh, I, I have another question I'll ask, and then I have a question of my own. The uh, how far this one is, and I'm always wondering too. How far south into Monterey uh, uh, does Tem C expect when you get to that point of of re restoring service on the rails? Uh, how far do you imagine this? Where, where would the southern terminus be? Uh, and and what about the popular path that now occupies where, where the trail has actually taken over the, the you know, where the tracks have been removed for the trail? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, like I said, the corridor is 100 feet wide, so there's plenty of room for train and multiple trails if you want. Sure. Um, yeah, so there's that. Um, the issue of where it stops in Monterey is still TBD. Mm -hmm. Our documents... Um, assume that it goes into downtown Monterey, like the Portola Plaza, <laughs> you know, Fisherman's Wharf. Um, it might not do that. Right. It might stop short of there. It all depends on where the political will is at the time that we get funding for the project. Uh -huh. um, so well, who knows? That's uh, a reason, what, what, do you, what do you think is a reasonable, you know, it's not going to go all the way to, the, to where it once did. Past. Well, no, because it once went all the way to Pebble Beach. That's yeah, right. And yeah, so yeah, no, it won't go to Pebble Beach. The tracks had have been taken out from Monterey to through Pacific Grove and to Pebble Beach. So those yeah. tracks don't exist anymore. The tracks do exist to Monterey, though. Yeah. Um, you can actually they're underneath the, the the path only in some places. There are lots of places you go on your path and you can you're right next to the tracks and you can see the tracks there. <laughs> they're still there. Um, but that doesn't mean that's where the train has to go. The train can go in the road. If it's a light rail, it, it can act like a bus and just be on the road, just like it does in San Jose and lots of other towns. That, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, and so, I, I love that myself. I feel like I missed a, an element of your question. I'm sorry. Oh, I think, <laughs> I think you covered it. It was like, how far, <laughs> what's a reasonable distance in Southern Terminus? And I think I think you, you, you answered that, you, you know, to go it's as far. a balance. Yeah, it's a balance between ridership and political will. Because if they say, oh, well, you have to stop at Seaside, and we do a ridership analysis and say, people want to go to Monterey, yeah. <laughs> like stopping in Seaside, what are they going to do in Seaside other than get a cab? No, <laughs> or, right, to go the rest or, of the way. You know, get a yeah. rental bike or whatever. But yeah, so um, it's you have to make that calculation when you get to the point of. of well, you have a you have a harder time of it than we do because we have the tracks sitting right there, and we just need to just use them uh, or upgrade them. Uh, I'm going to ask you. Yeah, a little more complicated than ours, right. I have to say. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, say again. Just a little bit more complicated. Just a little bit. Uh, the the uh, I remember, and you can refresh our memory, but. I remember uh, some discussion at a presentation during a, probably a rail policy committee meeting um, when uh, when you learned that the there was a tie vote. I think it must have been last year in April after the April vote. And isn't don't your doesn't Monterey's plans for the Salinas to Gilroy extension, your ridership numbers, your passenger numbers, wasn't weren't some of those numbers um, relying on or hoping for a certain number of passengers boarding from Santa Cruz from the branch line at Pajaro Station? Uh, well, they do. Yeah, they do in terms of the Pajaro Station, but it doesn't necessarily rely on rail providing those passengers. Uh -huh. uh, the Pajaro Station does assume that there will be quite a few people, like 80% of our ridership is estimated to come from Santa Cruz County, but that could mean somebody walking across the Watsonville Bridge from their house. That's still coming from Santa Cruz County. Okay. That's, a, that's an interesting uh, figure, though, 80% of, mm -hmm. of passengers there uh, being... being uh, not, not for that entire you know, service. Pajaro's pretty tiny little village there. No, not yeah, of course, but yeah. people coming down from the from Santa Cruz County to board at, at uh, Watsonville Station, Pajaro. Thank Pajaro you. Mm -hmm. I got another question. It's, uh, <laughs> is there a Monterey County analog uh, to our Santa Cruz, quote, Greenway? And, and he means 
So are, are there opponents to your projects like we have here? This uh, well, there's no opposition that I know of to the Salinas Rail project, mm -hmm. um, but that's different, right? I think he's yeah. whoever the person who asked that question is uh, probably meant the Monterey Branch Line project. Um, yeah, um, there. When we were going through the environmental process and doing a huge amount of public outreach and having public meetings, remember when we used to do that? <laughs> yeah. Um, all over the place, the most the most concern was voiced about the windows on the Bay Park, um, which is right next to a uh, six lane uh, Del Monte Avenue. So they were really worried that some people would get run over by the train going down Del Monte Avenue, and it's. Yeah. One of those things where it's like, well, perception is reality. So we got to show what that would look like. What would it look like for a light rail train to go down Del Monte Avenue next to the buses and the trucks and the whatever else is happening on Del Monte Avenue? And so we did a little video, um, what do they call that? Visualization, yeah. you know, uh, computer animated, whatever to show what it would look like to, to see that it really isn't that big of a change from having the kind of traffic we have today. And in fact, if we have all these people on the train instead of in their cars, it would actually be safer. But that's, you know, it's just something where when once people get this idea in their head that it's gonna, you know, kill their dogs and children, they can't, they can't be unconvinced about that. <laughs> just, it's an unwinnable argument. Yeah. But we didn't, I mean, other than that, we didn't have that kind of, um, it was really focused on that particular part, that particular segment. It wasn't about the entire project. Um, if you go way, way, way back, in like my early years at the agency, um, there was a mayor in the city of Marina who said that there would be a train going through her town over her dead body. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, since then, we have lost that particular mayor. <laughs> so <laughs> morbid, but. Yeah. She was very adamantly opposed to it, but she was one individual and the rest of the city did not agree with her. She did not, she did not keep her office, but it wasn't necessarily because of that project. So I'm just, I'm just sort of going through like in my head about what opposition the project has faced and that that's what I come up with. Well, I think we enjoy a, a, a tremendous amount of support uh, here and we, we look to uh, you all, Tamsi, had a had a uh, a success uh, well successful had a survey that showed significant support uh, regionally for 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 rail. Um, yes. We have uh, had the the RTC has conducted studies, other studies, and and, and really, I think that what we I think that there's a a very loud minor, uh, minority, a very loud and well financed uh, uh, campaign with this. Measure D, I, I, I thought of another question for you though. What, what impact, and this could go to Rod too, what impact, we have a, every county has a general plan. And in our general plan is mentioned, for example, working with TAMC for the around the bay, uh, I think that's a specific section in our circulation, part of our, our, uh, our, our general plan. And, and without put, trying, you know, without trying to put you in a political spot, I think it's a, a, a question that could have an objective answer. What impact would it have on the on Monterey's transportation system if if a if a measure were passed that erased every mention of rail from the general plan? And would that help or hurt or or uh, <laughs> seriously? If it's not an unless it's an obvious question, but that's what we're facing up here. Um, how important is a general plan and and including regional planning language for 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 rail, for example? You're asking me this. I, I am, and then I'm going to let Rod take it too. I think I'll just let Rod take it. If okay, he wants. let's let Rod take it. I don't blame you. That's why I gave. That's why I kind of was hoping, you know, giving you an out, Rod. This is what we're facing. Well, I I heard your question, Barry. Yeah. And I'm going to have to be pulled away in just a minute. Okay. But the the uh, uh, it's uh, it's obvious that uh, to eliminate any of the alternatives uh, in a general plan, it would be uh, devastating. Uh, it, it, it's limiting your future, and I I think it just would not be the right thing to do. Uh, in in fact, uh, your giants 
of your uh, former boards of supervisors led by Fred Keeley, mm -hmm. uh, carefully studied this upside down backwards with millions of dollars worth of consulting fees. And they came to conclusion that you needed that rail line. Yeah. And that's why, they, that's why the general plan was modified to include the rail line in the general plan. And uh, uh, to, to see that now discarded without significant study, purely on a political vote, uh, stimulated by one member of the Board of Supervisors, is, is unconscionable. And uh, it, it's obviously self-serving to the wealthy people along the, of the right-of-way and, and by folks who have vested interests in automobiles. And the rest of us need to stand up and reject that. Thank you. I, I'm going to add just two days ago, speaking of leadership and, and, and heroes of our movement, um, I believe it was on Monday or Tuesday that a, uh, we, we, we saw a letter written jointly by the, the past three executive directors of our RTC, Linda Wilshus and Pat Mullen, and uh, I mean, Pat, Pat Tillman, and um, George Don Darrow, who uh, came out with a very, very articulate set of reasons that we need to uh, defeat Measure D and you know continue with these decades of of plans and uh, and so uh, with that, uh, Rod and, and Christina, thank you so much for uh, coming to our our club and uh, sharing the you know. The history, the plans, the importance of climate change, and the way that transportation fits uh, into whether we we make it out of here alive or not, uh, and uh, and really, I just want to want to thank both of you for for being here. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Barry. It was it was an honor to be associated with Christina. Uh, <laughs> it was yeah, an honor to be it, associated with you, Ron. <laughs> yeah, thank you both for coming, and uh, good luck to you. Thank you, thank you, indeed.